Hi, me again again. Um, I'm Rebecca Christofferson at Louisiana State University, the arbovirologist. And previously I talked about an overview of arbovirology and then all about mosquitoes. So now I'm gonna go a little bit different and talk about what do we do when we have understudied arboviruses and the, from top to finish, how do we characterize these arboviruses? So I'm gonna talk about the case of arthobunioviruses in Rwanda. So first, this is a problem of One Health, but what is One Health and why do we care? So One Health is the idea that you have environmental, animal, and people health, and that you cannot optimize one without optimizing the other. So it's just a concept of let's all take care of the planet so that we all have a planet to live on. And so vector-borne diseases, which is you know a, a broader term for more than arboviruses, but any pathogen transmitted by a vector, is the perfect example of One Health, because most often vector-borne diseases are influenced by the environment. There is a subset of them that are of public health importance to people, but a lot of the times they are of veterinary or wildlife or zoonotic importance. And so we really have already been working in this space of this triad of environment, um, animal, and human, and human health. So we're going to talk about One Health in Rwanda. Cows are culturally and economically important in Rwanda. And these right here are some native cows to Rwanda, and they're beautiful. But they live really close to people, not just these, but a bunch of different uh, types of cows. And they're part of a program called One Cow Per Family. And this is a program that the government of Rwanda instituted to combat um, child growth stunting. And what they did was they provided every family with a cow, which was a source of calcium and other vitamins for children to combat child stunting, and they've seen success with it. But what that means is that cows, again, live really close to people. What they also have in Rwanda, and in general in Sub-Saharan Africa, is Rift Valley Fever. And Rift Valley Fever virus is a flebal virus, which is a type of bunyu virus, of animal and human health importance in Rwanda. This virus is um, cyclical, it's seasonal, and it uh, causes outbreaks in cattle that manifest as abortions or as hemorrhagic fever. It's also been called the uh, disease of abattoirs, which is like a butcher, or veterinarians. And that's because Rift Valley fever um, causes kind of a big mess from infected cattle. So if you think about hemorrhaging, that's, that's a lot of fluids everywhere. And if you think about abortions or miscarriages in cows, that's also a lot of fluids. And so what that means is that there's a lot of virus contaminating the environment. And when a butcher goes to um, butcher a cow that has infected, either symptomatically or not, then that is a chance for that butcher to become infected. And the same thing when a veterinarian goes to treat, there's just a lot of virus around, and then you have transmission to people. And so Rift Valley Fever is a problem in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Rwanda. Now these other buniviruses of interest, Bunyamwera, which is Bunyamwera, Batai and Ngari have also been sporadically detected or suspected in sub-Saharan Africa. These are different kinds of buniviruses. They're of the orthobunivirus genus, and um, they have not really they have not been isolated specifically in Rwanda before. Now, an overview of these orth of these three orthobunyaviruses. Uh, showed that the distribution of them is somewhat sporadic. So you see uh, the red dots. Um, pertain to Bataille. So you see Bataille here is sort of an, uh, associated with European transmission. And it's maintained in a bird mosquito cycle, um, as far as we know. And so Bataille here, again, is, is that one isolation way back in the 50s or 60s from Uganda and then primarily in Europe. Whereas Bunyamwera and Ngari kind of has stayed in this, um, this sort of African distribution. Now the interesting thing about these three viruses in particular is that Bunyamwera and Bataille are parental viruses for Ngari. The genetic structure of buniviruses is that they have three discrete uh, genome segments. And when, they have a, when you have a co-infection of Bunyamwera and Bataille, for example, then you have an opportunity for those segments to sort of rearrange themselves. And we have um, several examples of reassortments throughout the bunyavirus family. But in particular, Ngari is thought to be, to, is the putative child of Bunyamwera and Bataille. It shares two gene segments of Bunyamwera and one of Bataille. And so we were really interested in characterizing these viruses because they haven't been really well characterized. Bunyamwera has been more characterized than the other two. But also we kind of wanted to compare 
across several different properties the child virus with its parents. And so that's the basis of the talk that I'm going to give today. So the first thing you do when you characterize uh, an undercharacterized virus is you throw it in cell culture. Let's see what it, how it grows. So we put it in Vero cells because that's what most people have laying around, and we really didn't know what it was going to do comparatively. So the different colors are doses, um, all the way from one virion per um, uh, milliliter of supernatant, all the way up to six uh, logs, six logs. So we have um, really no difference in the growth. So in Vero cells, there was not a whole lot of difference in the growth of these three viruses. So here we see no sort of advantage of the child virus over the parents. Um, but we did notice something interesting when we did this, and that was at 30 days post-infection, we still had a lot of detectable RNA. So when we go and we, we look at these growth curves, what we do is we usually test for RNA using something called quantitative real-time PCR. And we noticed that there was a lot of RNA. And so we wanted to see, does that RNA equal infectious virus? So to do that, we took um, RNA from, well, I'm sorry, we took virus and we just put it in a tube with media, cell-free media, and we stuck it in the incubator for 30 days. After 30 days, we took that tube and we took what was in it the tube supernatant combination, and we put it on new cells, and we tested over a week, and then we looked for viral growth. So the, uh, the concept is if you get more out than you put in, then there was replication. And for all three viruses, we saw that we did actually get more out than we put in. So this tells us that these three viruses are stable in extracellular conditions for up to 30 days post post-infection. And why that's important will become clearer later on. But just remember that in your head for now. But don't worry, we also figured out how to kill it. So we took a commonly used uh, detergent used in things like ELISA's and um, it's called Triton X100 and we saw that it inactivated all three viruses. So this is a representative um, of all three, but they all three look the same, but this is Bunyavirus. This is cell culture at uh, negative control, so you see there's not a whole lot of disruption of the monolayer. Cells are they look okay. This is Bunyamura at four days post-infection. So you see these kind of divots and pivots and whatnot. That's just Bunyamura doing its thing. It's killing all the cells. But if you look at the inactivation of Bunyamura, this is after one hour incubation with the detergent and we four days post-inoculation onto uh, Vero cells, you see that it looks more like the negative control, which has no virus, than it does the infectious uh, treatment. So here we are, we've shown that we can inactivate the virus. Even if it's environmentally stable, we know how to kill it. So that was part of what we did in vitro. Then we moved on to in vivo. So a lot of studies, not a lot of studies, but some studies had looked at one or two of these viruses in a mouse model. But we wanted to put all three and compare again. And so the first thing we did was put it into a competent model, a, a mouse model that was not um, immunocompromised in any kind of way. It's just a regular old mouse. And what we found was that this mouse did not get sick. So here we have Bataille and Bunyamura. And what we see is this, this detection of virus at day one is probably the same virus we put in. It's not replicating. It's not progeny. It's just, it was still there. We call this process clearance. So the virus was cleared out of, the, out of these mice, and there was only five per group, really, really quickly. Ingari showed a little bit more variability um, than the parental strains, and it was an interesting find that may or may not have significance. But we kind of harken back to the reports of Ingari having more of a um, more of a um, severe manifestation in human populations and has been reported with the other two. But again, that's based on limited reports from human populations and limited study of these viruses. So we don't really want to say that this is necessarily a thing, but it was interesting to see. So what do we find out from this infection? Well, we did some other things with it, but the main goal is that this mouse is not a good candidate for infection studies. Because sometimes in science, you get negative results. And the first thing that most students want to do is cry until I remind them that negative results are still results. So we got data, and it may not be the data that people are looking for, but we did determine that this mouse is not a good candidate for infection studies. And what did that lead us to? Well, it led us to a knockout mouse. 
So with some other studies that I have done for dengue and Zika, uh, and Zika virus, we've used a knockout mice because these particularly flaviviruses, are, they don't infect mice very well. So we use <clears throat> what's called an interferon regulatory factor three and seven double knockout mouse. And what this mouse model is deficient in is these two factors down here that directly go into the pathway that makes interferon type one. And interferon type one, which is interferon alpha and beta, is one of the first innate respo immune responses that's antiviral in an infection. And so we did not ablate it, it's not completely gone, but we did downregulate this, um, this antiviral response in this particular mouse. I say we, the mouse already came like that, but the mouse does have a deficient antiviral response. And so in dengue and in Zika, this means that they're more susceptible than the immunocompetent um, mice like the ones we used before. So when we put Bunyamuera into this mouse model, what did we see? We saw that 100% of the mice developed hunched posture and lethargy, which is a common clinical symptom for, or clinical sign for mice just not feeling well. We also noticed that 62.5% of them uh, presented with facial swelling. And this was very marked and it was posthumously noted. But facial edema is seen often with another Bunya virus infection in humans, which is loss of fever. Now, not saying that Bunya muera is loss of fever, because remember, this is in mice and it's in a messed up mouse. This is not directly comparable to what we see in the real world. But it is an interesting finding. And I'll tell you what we could possibly use this model for in a minute. We also saw high viremia. They got really high viremia, up about six logs. Now we put in three, so that's a pretty low dose. We put in three logs, which is uh, about mm, a thousand virions per milliliter. And we put it in the mouse. We got about eight at peak, seven to eight logs out. And then we also had 100% mortality by day six. So these mice are very susceptible, even at relatively low doses of this virus. We also looked at the pathology of these mice. And what we found was that we had necrotizing ophoritis in the ovary, but we also had some necrosis in the uterus. And this is interesting because the symptoms, or not the symptoms, but the uh, manifestations of Bunyamuera in cattle tend to be abortions or affect the reproductive tract of the, of the cattle. And so finding these sort of reproductive tract associated um, lesions is a potential use for this mouse model. We also saw skin necrosis, a lot of mast cell de degranulation, which just means like a lot of inflammation in your skin. And then we found diffuse um, edema in the eyelid. So this just means that the eyelid skin and the, the space between cells is just filled with fluid. And that's probably what contributed to the facial swelling and the edema of these mice. So that was some interesting finds that we weren't necessarily uh, expecting to find in this mouse. And so what did this tell us? It told us that this mouse model is very susceptible to Bunyamuera infection because we only did Bunyamuera, we didn't do the other two. And it does recapitulate some of the aspects of the disease seen in ruminants, like abortions in cattle. The other thing is, is that it's been suggested that we could use this model as a possible diffuse uh, hemorrhagic disease model, a proxy model. And the reason that this is interesting is because Bunyamuera is a BSL-2 or a biosafety level 2 virus, and because it's not deemed to be really, really um, dangerous for trained laboratory personnel. And so if you have the opportunity to study a diffuse hemorrhagic disease at a lower biosafety level, that opens up um, the study of this type of uh, pathology to people who don't have access to high biocontainment laboratories. Because again, we're not saying Bunyamuera equals loss of fever. We're saying Bunyamuera in this messed out mouse gives us interesting things that may or may not look like loss of fever. And so some of the, those are some of always the caveats of studying mouse models or studying vertebrate models, trying to extrapolate back to what we see in the real world. And that's just part of, part of science and what we have to do. So we've done in vivo, we've done in vitro, we've kind of had some ideas about characterizing these viruses. And what we had originally planned to do was we had originally planned to go to Rwanda 
because my student, uh, um, the newly minted Dr. Fausta Tutuzzi, is from Rwanda. And she wanted to see, that, uh, is there evidence that these viruses are circulating in Rwanda? Because Rift Valley fever is there, and sometimes these viruses have been attributed to uh, Rift Valley fever-like disease. So are they there? And we just haven't found it yet. So originally, we were going to go do a sero survey. And what that means is we were going to bleed a bunch of cows, check their serum for antibodies against these viruses. That was what we originally planned. Well, turns out, plans change. There was a giant outbreak in 2018 of Rift Valley fever in Rwanda. And at that point, we were able to partner with the Rwandan Agricultural Board and their very, very smart and wonderful scientists there to sort of test Rift Valley fever suspected cases to see, are these viruses contributing to Rift Valley fever-like disease? So we have 157 blood samples from cattle all over the country that have suspected Rift Valley fever. And the inclusion criteria was they were had an abortion within five days, they were had uh, symptoms of hemorrhagic fever, or they shared a farm with the death case um, of Rift Valley fever suspicion within the last five days. So we found that 70% of the Rift Valley fever suspected cases were actually negative and only 30 were positive, and we determined positivity by regular old PCR. All cases of hemorrhagic fever were indeed Rift Valley fever. So here you see a cow who's got some hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging from his nose and then over here, so very obvious um, hemorrhaging. And then we decided to test the negative for our orthobuniviruses of interest, and we found two of our arthrobuniviruses. So even though Ingari is a reassortant of Bunyamura and Bataille, the way that we des designed our diagnostics, we were able to distinguish between Ingari and the other two viruses. And so what we, this is representative of Bataille. This is the M and L segments that we looked at. Um, and we found that we had two infections of Bunyamura, three infections of co-infection of Bunyamura and Bataille, and two infections of just a Bataille infection. And so we had seven total cattle that showed that this, these viruses are in fact circulating. What we also found was that we had some combinations of all of these gene segments in 10 cows that were infected with Rift Valley fever, but seemed to be co-infected with something else. So we, did, we weren't able to determine what exactly, but there are other orthobuniviruses like gemstone, like Alicia, possibly others that are circulating in the region. And so perhaps they are co-infected with Rift Valley fever and these other orthobuniviruses. So putting it all together, all of the cattle that were infected with Bunyamura and or Bataille experienced abortion. So this harkens back to our mouse model where we saw some involvement of the ovaries and the uterus. And perhaps there's something there that we could look into further in this mouse model to sort of help us study the pathogenesis of these viruses and how it leads to this reproductive tract involvement in cattle. But going back to the extracellular stability of these three viruses, an abortion in cows results in not only um, a fetus that is just covered in goo, but an environment that's also covered in goo. And so if you remember, I talked about Rift Valley fever and the transmission to people being more a function of the environmental goo or the blood products or the fluids from these um, hemorrhagic or abortion cases. We show that the stability that's seen in extracellular media may contribute to that also being a risk for these three orthobunuviruses, or at least for Bunyamura and Bataille that we actually found um, in this region. So again, we now can tie back to our in vitro cell culture experiments um, to, see, to sort of make an estimated guess about what we think might be a risk in the field. And so again, we go all the way from in vitro through the field to really characterize what's going on with these, with these orthobuniviruses. So what do we learn? We learn that these viruses have similar kinetics in vitro. And so at first glance, that looks unimportant. But in following experiments, you usually want to do what we call match titer. And that means you want to make sure that every group gets the same amount of virus 
across all three viruses. And so when we know the growth kinetics of all these viruses, that helps us determine, well, I have to shoot the virus five days before my mouse experiment so I can harvest on peak day. And actually in Bunyamura, it's day four, so it helps you kind of plan your experiments so it increases efficiency in how your lab runs for future experiments. We also learned that the stability of extracellular in extracellular conditions, but we can kill it, so that's good. This harkens back to biosafety both in the field and in the lab, and also it does um, identify the utility of that Triton X100 to deactivate the virus. We haven't done anything with mosquitoes yet because we're waiting to do that, but that is something that we really need to do to finish characterizing these viruses. And then we learned that the C57 mouse is not a good infection model, so I've done this so that you don't have to. And then we have determined that the knockout mouse is um, susceptible and that there may be utility of this mouse to study pathogenesis in the reproductive tract. And then maybe it can also be used as a proxy model for diffuse hemorrhagic fever, uh, disease. And then finally, our field work. Um, these viruses are in Rwanda. That was our, that was our uh, hypothesis, and that's what we showed. So it's interesting because we now have sort of filled in a little gap in the known distribution of these viruses. They weren't previously um, published in that they were in Rwanda, so now we can say that they are. That's not particularly surprising, except for the case of Bataille. So again, Bataille, if you remember the distribution, was mainly a virus isolated and detected in Europe. Well, now we have evidence that it's circulating in Rwanda. The other interesting thing is that it's circulating in cattle. It's infecting cattle, causing abortion. So this bird virus apparently can, can cause damage in more than one vertebrate host. And that's very interesting. The other interesting thing is that the co-infection of cattle. So if you remember, I talked about Ngari. We didn't find it in Rwanda. But I talked about it being the child of Bunyamura and Bataille. The reassortant to make a new virus has to happen when co-infection occurs. And so generally we think about this happening in the vector just because there's more opportunity. More vectors generally tend to get, um, uh, tend to get infected and then the infection lasts longer in, in vectors. So once a vector is infected, it doesn't generally clear it. So there's more opportunity for co-infection, more opportunity for this reassortant to occur. But now we've shown that co-infection can happen in cattle, so maybe we need to start looking at cattle as maybe a vessel for a potential reassortant um, of, of these orthobunuviruses. And finally, the most important conclusion is that we never have all the answers. So even though I seem like I've given you a lot of information here that sound conclusive, all I've really done is answer more, uh, is raise more questions. So if the virus is, especially with Bataille, if it's in, if it's in Rwanda, but it's only in, in Europe, there's a lot of space between Rwanda and Europe. So where else is it? Those are the kinds of questions that we still need to ask. And those are the kinds of questions that come up when you do research. You never have all the answers. So finally, I want to thank my lab members. Um, this is Fausta Dutuzzi. She is, this is right after she defended and um, was minted the newly uh, PhD um, from my lab. I'm very proud of her. She's back in Rwanda. This is Hanley in a box. She thinks she's part cat, clearly. And this is uh, Chrissy, who's a PhD and my student, who's demonstrating how a spillover event might happen. Just kidding, this is her pet squirrel, Rocky. And uh, finally, I have to, again, acknowledge my funding and uh, the support of HHMI and iBiology. And uh, that, that's it.